this uh, afternoon uh, in regards to a shooting uh, officer involved critical incident a use of force that happened on uh, August 2nd 2020 uh, and as it was in, uh, reviewed and investigated by the district attorney's office the it disinvolved the uh, officers uh, uh, who belt uh, use of deadly force at 2352 West 7680 uh, South, West Jordan City, Utah, on August 2, 2020. It was investigated uh, as per our protocol by an outside agency, in this case, Salt Lake City Police Department uh, uh, as well. And uh, so, uh, the, as this was presented to us, and we reviewed, uh, uh, reviewed the materials that were presented to us, uh, uh, the, the facts and conclusions that we reached uh, in this matter uh, were based on what we gathered from the protocol investigation uh, and, uh, and, and should any additional uh, uh, and subsequent uh, uh, facts and opinions and conclusions uh, uh, come in terms of any additional facts come to us then we will of course uh, change our outcome as well. On August 2, 2020, West Jordan Police Department officers Hoogveld and Jackson responded to a West Jordan neighborhood to investigate a report of a suspicious and possibly stolen GMC pickup truck. When they arrived in the area, the officers uh, met with the complainant who told them that he had followed the truck into this in particular neighborhood. He explained that the truck belonged to his friend's aunt and the truck was recently stolen. Uh, and the family members had seen the truck driving on a nearby highway. The complainant had followed the truck and then called the police. The officers approached the truck. Uh, the officers Hoogveld from behind the truck, and we will show you a little bit later. Uh, he came and parked his vehicle behind the, uh, the truck, and Officer Jackson came and parked his vehicle in front of the truck. As Officer Hoogveld talked to the passenger, so Officer Hoogveld went to the right side, uh, 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 to the passenger side, as he spoke uh, to the rear seat passenger, Officer Jackson uh, talked to the driver and asked for backup units to come to his location. Officer Jackson uh, asked the driver multiple times with no compliance to step outside of the truck. At first, the driver, later identified as Cyrus Carpenter, reached out through the open driver's window to open the door with his left hand, but then he quickly withdrew it. Mr. Carpenter brought his right hand up with a handgun and fired a shot, hitting Officer Jackson in the neck and exiting out his back. Actually, the bullet uh, uh, grazed his chin, hit his uh, shoulder and neck area, and then traveled down uh, uh, his back and exited his back. Officer Jackson stepped back and withdrew. He couldn't get his uh, uh, weapon out of the holster, so, so, so he took cover behind a car. Officer Jackson indicated that his hand was immobilized as he tried to reach for his service weapon. He could not c uh, control his hand, and he even tried to reach for it with his uh, left hand, and he could not uh, 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 get to the weapon, so he uh, retreated to the rear end of the, uh, of the car. Um, uh, at the, uh, uh, Officer Hoogveld, who was then to the side, uh, heard the shot and saw Officer Jackson react as he was hit. Officer Hoogveld ran out to the front of the truck drew his firearm from his holster. Mr. Carpenter raised the handgun and pointed it at Officer Hoogveld through the windshield and fired towards Officer Hoogveld. What we also learned is that actually when uh, the shooting occurs uh, to Officer Jackson, he actually points the weapon at Officer Hoogveld and then tracks Officer Hoogveld's movements as he moves to the front of the vehicle and at that point points the gun at Mr. Officer Hoogveld who then fired through the windshield towards, uh, 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 towards, he fired through the windshield to, uh, 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 towards the officer. The car, uh, Mr. Carpenter turned and fired again at Officer Jackson. Officer Hoogveld fired multiple uh, rounds uh, at the driver. Mr. Carpenter got out of the truck and Officer Hoogveld tracked him as he exited the truck. Mr. Carpenter pointed his gun at Officer Hoogveld as he moved and Officer Hoogveld fired at him. As Mr. Carpenter ran up the street, Officer Hubert stopped firing and reloaded his weapon. Uh, uh, Mr. Carpenter went to the sidewalk, turned again, and started firing his gun at Officer Hoogveld. In a subsequent interview with protocol investigators, Officer Hoogveld said that he remembered 
quote, bullet whizzing, a bullet whizzing, by, uh, whizzing right by him, end quote, and hitting a fence behind him. As he took a moment to reflect on the situation and his surroundings, Officer Hoogveld said he knew that the man with the, uh, the, the uh, and I'll explain to you as, uh, when we go through there, uh, that there was a civilian who came there, a man with a dog who, who got caught in the crossfire there, that he knew that he was there as well as other people in the, uh, in the neighborhood, and he said to himself, yeah, I need to shoot this guy or he's going to hit me. Officer Hoogveld said he took aim and fired again at Mr. Carpenter, who moved away from him and went into the side of the yard, uh, side of, yard of the house. Officer Hoogveld called out on the radio that shots had been fired and returned to tr uh, treat Officer Jackson's injuries. Officer Hoogveld and Officer White, who arrived on the scene, went to, uh, back to the side yard uh, um, where Mr. Carpenter had walked towards. They found him laying on the grass with his handgun uh, nearby. Officer and medical personnel arrived to provide first aid. Mr. Carpenter died from his gunshot wounds and injuries. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge that both officers from the West Jordan Police Department uh, gave interviews uh, to investing, investigating officers, and they need to be commended for their transparency and cooperation. Furthermore, I want to also point out that we commend both of the officers uh, on their de decision to provide the interview prior to watching a video of the incident as we've encouraged officers to do so. To the extent that the officers believe that the, they, they believe, they also believe that by providing an interview before watching, video removes the potential for someone to suggest that an officer's testimony was influenced by or, by, uh, or the product of the, the video recording of events rather than officer's memory. Uh, we and a much uh, established literature in this area so, uh, uh, agree. Uh, when, uh, when an interview is so accomplished, the facts recounted in an interview may differ from those established in the video re recording record, but this is to be expected and not a product of desire to mislead or fabricate. Rather, it's a reflection of the nature of memory and recall and lends credibility to an officer's recollection of, of events. Once the in initial interview has been accomplished, if an officer desires to review the video recording afterwards and notes discrepancies, another follow-up interview affords an officer an opportunity to address those inconsistencies if necessary. And we wanted to sort of indicate both officers gave us extensive interviews on that. What we want to show you, I will show you four recordings. It is important to note that the two responding officers, although they had body-worn camera, they did not initiate the body-worn camera. However, each one of the, video, uh, the vehicles that they were in had a dash camera available. And so uh, we will show you the, uh, uh, one, uh, the first two will be uh, the dash cameras from there. The third one will be uh, when the responding officers ar arrived, they had their body-worn camera going and the assistance to uh, 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 Officer Jackson. And finally, the last will be a, a discovery of Mr. Carpenter uh, as their officers respond. I will also note that in the, when you look at the first video, it is extremely clear. Uh, the second video has, has a very dark filter on it, although it was light outside, as uh, uh, obvious from the first video. Uh, I wanted to show you the second video nonetheless, even though it's a little bit darkened, because it captures a different angle and helps us to enumerate the factual sequencing that uh, our team looked at when we analyzed this. So with that, uh, uh, Ben, would you uh, please uh, play that first video? This is uh, going to be from the perspective of Officer Hoogveld, who has parked so before he started. So you, you, it, what this video shows us from this perspective, this is from the dash camera from Officer Hoogveld, who is on the right side because he approached from the rear. They had uh, responded to the call. Officer Jackson was the initial responding call, uh, uh, called officer, so he took the lead to initiate <coughs> with the driver. Officer Hoogveld has moved to the right rear passenger side You'll notice that uh, there, there is a door that's open because there were passengers in the uh, right rear side of the, of the truck as well. Uh, Officer Jackson is in the front. 
This is from the perspective of Officer Hoogveld's uh, video. The second video will be from that car that you can see in that frame, which is Officer Jackson's car and the dash cam looking uh, towards the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the parked truck, which was followed there by the uh, complainant who identified it as stolen. The one other thing I'm going to mention, because it's not obvious here, as the officers approach there, you will see a, hear a side conversation that occurs, and that's the one point I wanted to point out. There was a citizen civilian who had found a lost dog, so while the officers are trying to engage with, the, uh, with this stolen vehicle, you'll hear this uh, uh, civilian start to talk with Officer Hoogveld, who will tell him to back up and uh, sit down. We'll get to that because he's trying to address the issue of the, uh, the stolen vehicle and this situation. So that is the context of that, uh, that civilian that Officer Hoogveld talks about in his interview that he gave to us, a good Samaritan who happened to have found a dog and saw the officers and wanted to uh, find the owner. So go ahead and play this, please. And turn it up as loud as it will go, please. Man? That's no. Officer Jackson. No? I don't think it's someone's hanging up or something. It's oh, okay. Is there any weapons in no, here? No, I'm sorry. That's Officer Hoopville. Uh, you, know, you know these guys? Okay. Friend? He's going to extract the passenger out. Hey, sir, we're going to be here just a minute. And that's the you Good Samaritan. I'll find you in a second. Me? Yeah, you. Okay, are you over there? You live? So I, I live uh, across the And Officer Huba uh, okay. needs to be because his attention is being divided be between a potentially dangerous there? situation and a civilian. Guys, make this easy for us, okay? Will you come step out here? He's going to start Can bringing him out. Cannabis, and it, fast. I just want to make sure you have no weapons or anything. Okay, go back this way. I see a knife. Don't reach for it, okay? I'm just going to take it out. You okay now pay that? attention to Jackson. Shots fired! Shots fired! Shots fired! Is it possible for you to fast forward to where the, the, the gun is presented? To the point where he pulls that gun. And I want you to pay, uh, the reason I'm asking Ben to play that back again is because that gun uh, uh, comes out very quickly and is fairly uh, present there. Huh? No? Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, now that we know that, I want again just play that one more time. Are there any weapons time. in here? Uh, you know, you know these guys. Okay, friend. Okay, okay. Are you over there? And hey, uh, sir, we're gonna be here just a minute. Where are you at? So we can find you in a second. Me? Yeah, you. And what this tells shows us also that there are three okay, sequences so are to the uh, firing. Live, one live, initially. Live. Second from the front of the vehicle, third uh, in the street. Sir, um, just I'm going to have you go over there. We're going to be busy. Will you stay there? Guys, make this easy for us, okay? Will you come step out here? Okay. Do me a favor, put your hands up the internal real fast. I just want to make sure you have no weapons. As soon as he starts talking that he's found a weapon, okay, I back. want you to focus your attention to the window and Officer right. Jackson. I see a knife. Don't reach for it, okay? I'm just going to take it out. You okay with that? There. Shots fired, shots fired, shots fired. And that's the third sequence of the firing. It, because we believe the truck, well, we know the truck was stolen, and the driver wasn't familiar with it, when he steps out, 
he forgets the how high it is and then and that that he still misses the uh, guard and that's when he falls down now we're going to play it from officer jackson's this so as i mentioned it's light out there but the filter on it was darker so it looks a little darker but this video was also critical for us when we went through the analysis because it gives us the other perspective and then the direct communications with Do uh, officer jackson and also the presentment of the gun and then the fouling, and then you'll notice what happens in this that we were able to recreate is that after the initial fouling and the volleying of gun, that exchange occurs in the front of the vehicle, the suspect falls to the ground uh, there. We think he may have been hit at that point, and then he will actually go down, and I'll draw your attention to, you'll see some branches moving to your frame up on the top. We think that that's from a fence uh, tree, and you'll see uh, uh, him either moving along it and he, at that point, turns around and uh, uh, fires at Officer Hubelt. Officer Hubelt, in his testimony to us, says that he pulls the person out, he can hear Officer Jackson's exchange, and he hears the gu uh, gunshot, he looks back up, he sees the suspect actually having shot Officer Jackson, points the gun at him, and now he's taking evasive action and he says that he gets tracked, and, and as they get to the front of the vehicle, as he moves there and is unholstered, he sees the gun being pointed at him, and there's an initial, initial exchange that happens, which you'll hear pop, 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 and then the suspect jumps out, and then you hear the exchange follow up through. So this is a little bit darker, but if you pay attention, it uh, shows that exchange. So Hoogveld has already pulled in. That was the first video. He's to the side of the vehicle. Jackson is pulling up. He's going to now go and challenge the driver uh, on the, uh, 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 the uh, information and uh, about the stolen vehicle. Give me another second. Stay back there for me. That's Officer Jackson. Jackson. Stay on the ground. 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 He had testified in his statement that he could see that a driver was nervous, was shaking. He's giving him commands. And open the door. Open the door. I've already explained it to you. We have suspicion of this vehicle being stolen. So step out so we can verify that. Now. I'm giving you a rough order. So get out. He asked for backup. He falls. We think he gets hit here. And there's a branch to the right you'll see move uh, here. Right there. He goes there, he turns around, he can be seen turn around firing back at the officer, and that's how Officer Hoogveld returning fire. So we'll go to the next video. This is, uh, this was then the only, the, these were the body-worn cameras that were available to us from responding officers. The shooting has occurred, it's still a very dynamic situation. You can hear the cars coming up, they still don't know the status of what has happened in terms of uh, where everybody is. They know that Officer uh, Jackson has been hit, and this is rendering aid to Officer Jackson. That's his right arm. Uh, it, it's that blood starting to come down his right arm. It's sort of gone limp. They move him back to a safer, secured area. And 
and is in distress. You're good, bro. You're good. Just, just keep talking to me, man. Hey, stay here, Jackson. The suspect has run, but they don't know what his status is. But they know he's fired now uh, multiple shots at him. Go help two nine five. They're challenging one. And they remember they also had uh, suspects in the vehicle that they're trying to control as well. Just hit your shoulder somewhere. Do you have some shears, Sarge? Yeah. Let's cut this off. You're good, bro. Stay behind my truck. And they rendered aid to him at that point, and he was subsequently taken to the hospital. And uh, um, let me just sort of find one point that I wanted to make. Uh, the, the shot that he uh, uh, took, uh, as I said, grazed his chin, went down, down his uh, side, and also impact his, uh, impacted his vertebrae uh, uh, as well. Uh, the last video that we will show you uh, is that, uh, as I mentioned, it continued to be a dynamic situation as the officers respond in trying to discover the body uh, and the, uh, the suspect at that point. So go ahead and play that last one, if you will. Which truck is it? Which truck is it? Gage, which truck? In this backyard? That's Officer Hoopdell, uh, who's in farming. Get someone up with you, Em. Uh, he believes he hit him. Come up with me. And that's consistent with the path. That was the little branch that I was talking you can see moving when we were doing our sequencing. He went in this backyard. OK, we got one down right over here. Put your hands up now. Put your hands up. Show me your hands! Show me your hands now! Can you see his right hand? Okay, hold on, let me see if I can see anything. Her hand looks empty. Move up with me. They were not certain if he still uh, had the weapon. The, they tried to provide uh, aid at that time to Mr. Carpenter, who subsequently succumbed to the injuries uh, from his wounds. The download indicated that uh, uh, Officer Hoogwell uh, uh, fired his initial weapon, then uh, did a reload. He fired a total of 23 shots during this event. Uh, of those 23, uh, uh, what we have been able to sort of confirm uh, that it is that uh, Mr. S uh, Carpenter was hit seven times. He had two gunshot wounds to his back, one wound on his buttocks, to one wound in the back of his neck, one wo uh, wound in his uh, lower left arm, one wound to his anterior throat, and one wound to his right hand. And um, it, it, so based on what we had here, I also want to just take a second uh, to, uh, to say that every loss of life is unfortunate. And every time the government takes the life of a member of the community, the community is right to ask uh, why and deserves an explanation. Officers in every law enforcement agency in this county and state routinely risk their lives to protect the lives and safeties of those they serve. Officer Hoogveld did just that in this matter. 
His actions, though resulting in Mr. Carpenter's death, likely saved many lives in addition to his own. We commend Officer Hoogbell's actions and those of his colleagues in the West Jordan Police Department for their service to their community. We also commend Officer Hoogbelt and Officer Jackson and their counsel, as, uh, as well as West Jor uh, Jordan Police of uh, Officers and personnel for testifying about their actions and decisions in this case. Officer Hoogbelt's explanation of his decision to use deadly force against Mr. Carpenter reflects his willingness to be accountable to the community he serves when circumstances require him to take the life of a member of the community. He honors his department, his colleagues, his profession, and himself by explaining his use to use deadly force. When we looked at the sequencing and the totality of everything that we had, we conclude that the facts of this case, as outlined, uh, 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 support a finding that Officer Hoogfeld reasonably believed that deadly force was necessary to prevent death or serious bodily injury. As such, the facts meet the elements of the affirmative legal defense of justification and afford Officer Hoogfeld the legal defense of, to any criminal charges. Because, uh, <coughs> excuse me, because Officer Hoogfeld's justified use of deadly force constitutes a legal defense, we decline to file criminal charges against Officer Hoogfeld in this manner, matter. I also want to take a second that prior to coming down here, uh, I had the opportunity to meet with uh, the stepmother of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the decedent, uh, Mr. Car uh, Carpenter, as well as his father, and, uh, and they wanted me to convey uh, to the community uh, that uh, they uh, exp expressed their regrets at the conduct of their, uh, uh, their son, and they uh, have sincere apologies for their son's conduct uh, to the officers involved, and they were very concerned about the safety of the officer. Uh, that was about uh, just uh, about 20 minutes before I came to speak to you. So uh, with that, uh, that brings to conclusion our findings on this, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't want to use the term slam dunk or open and shut case, but of all of these that you reviewed, was this the most, one of the most clear given the evidence? I, I think it's important to note that every use of force has a unique set of circumstances uh, to them, and we always look at in the isolation of that. But I think what this uh, uh, certainly shows, the, sometimes the complexity of what happens and the real present danger that can go very quickly. Uh, it was unfortunate that the two officers did not have their body-worn cameras activated, but it was very fortunate that the two dash cams, when they positioned their cars, were activated. And I think what is really important to notice here, that uh, they did everything by protocol. Officer Jackson approached. They had a, a, a valid, verified complaint. They had a probable cause. They made contact. And Officer Jackson was as professional as he could be. And in a moment's flash moment, that gun came up, uh, and but for the, when we looked at it, but for, that was very clear what happened there. But for the fact that the truck was r jacked up and Officer Jackson uh, was not as tall, uh, that, that it created a, 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 disparity, a discrepancy in the angle, and he was very fortuitous. Given that same scenario at eyesight, that was a headshot wound that would have uh, been fatal to that officer. So when we looked at it, we always approach all our cases without any bias or any preconceived -con conclusion. But once we laid the sequencing out, it was fairly straightforward uh, that the, the, uh, the initial uh, uh, force was initiated by uh, Mr. Carpenter in a very violent way. And at that moment, once that was done, uh, the officers had no other choice but to uh, safeguard their lives and their community. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, we had extensive interview with both officers, uh, to their credit, and Officer Hoogveld talks about it. He hears the shot, he hears that, he then sees the gun being presented to him, he tracks it, he's got a civilian with, uh, who's with a dog, and all of that. And at that point, uh, there's, uh, uh, he did exactly what he was trained to do in the fashion uh, to respond to the threat that was presented to him. So it was very clear and we were lucky to have the videos that we did, did have. Off of that, uh, is that common for officers to park their cars knowing that a dash cam might uh, show an incident happen like this? Uh, again, I, you know, I, you know, I, 
you know, why officers sometimes forget to turn their video cameras on and whatever, those are all dynamic situations. Uh, and the decision to make this, uh, the, the way they did was more of a tactical decision because you had the parked vehicle, uh, Officer Jackson's vehicle comes in at, at the front, Officer Hoogveld who went around and parked behind him, that was a tactical decision because they could certainly see that there were multiple occupants in the vehicle. And with Officer Hoogveld coming down there, it was a tactical decision for him to give support but since he wasn't the initial uh, call officer. He went there to uh, distract and to keep an eye on the passengers. Officer Jackson had the primary to respond to engage with the, uh, with the, with the driver. So those were tactical decisions that they made, but we were very lucky that their dash cams were going on. Uh, there was also other, uh, uh, there was a ring camera that we had. We also had other body-worn camera. We had uh, uh, some uh, civilian witnesses, but this was the most concrete, definitive evidence that we had, and we were very lucky that the, both dash cams were running uh, at this time. You mentioned passengers, plural. We saw one taken out by yeah. Officer Hoogville. Who else was in that? There was another, there were, I believe, altogether three uh, uh, individuals in there, and at that point, as, uh, as Officer Hoogveld is doing, he's trying to remove them and, and keep them engaged with him and give support to Officer Jackson. So there were, I believe, altogether three individuals. So driver plus two passengers? Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so you mentioned, I mean, pointed out very clearly how quickly that happened. Uh, did Officer Jackson, during his interview process, uh, even realize at, all, at any point what was happening at all? Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, Officer Jackson uh, t uh, was very thorough in his he talked about. And again, I want to commend him for not actually viewing his vid any of the videos because he wanted to make sure that he was giving us something from his memory as he experienced it. And he talks about uh, 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 where he positioned himself. Uh, he talks about that he noticed that the driver's hands were shaking. He, he, he's focused on the driver. He's trying to give him commands. And, uh, and, and he's now assessing what's going on as well. And, and uh, that uh, what he says is uh, that uh, he touches, uh, touches it, that is he goes out, try to reach it, he goes back, he goes, I'm like, keep your hands up. He drops his hand, I go to draw my gun. So he says he's, he's nervous about it, and he sees the hand go out of sight, so he, he goes, uh, uh, goes to draw his gun, uh, I don't know where he pulled it from, but that when he pulls with his right hand with a small black handgun, Officer Jackson said that he moved back and towards the truck, that's when he fired. So he's um, simultaneously perceiving and reacting to it. He says that gun comes out, he's shocked by it, he's right on top of it, and, and, uh, and he gets fired, uh, and, uh, and, he's at that, and he says, he goes, I could smell the gunpowder, felt the impact when the shot was fired, went black for what seemed like a brief second. Officer Jackson said that he came to and realized that he had been shot. Officer Jackson said that it seemed to him he had, he had to do one of two things. A quote, you're either going to neutralize the threat or you're going to get behind cover and start medical because you're probably going to die, end quote. And, uh, and he heard more gunshots ring. Uh, he saw bleeding down, uh, down his chest, uh, uh, he, was, he uh, was bleeding down his chest, and he says he tried to draw his weapon because he's worried about his uh, uh, fellow officer, but as he tries to draw his weapon, his hand is basically immobilized because it has gone down and traveled down, and he can't do it. He even says that he tries to go with his left hand uh, to draw that weapon, and he just felt helpless, so he's she uh, seeking shelter at that moment. And that's what you see him uh, go through that. It happens very quickly, but he laid out what his thought sequence was when he went through that process. Any, yes? Go ahead. Do we know why the body cams weren't activated? Uh, I don't know uh, why the body cams weren't uh, activated. Um, you know, different agencies have different protocols. And... Uh, and I, uh, you know, and, and I will just give you and share you my opinion. I think that... Uh, it would be worthwhile for agencies to seriously consider the utility of using body-worn cameras once you go on shift that it's just automatic. Uh, and, uh, and, but uh, 
uh, and I understand that, they, and they can certainly have well articulated policies of when you go off camera and under what conditions. But I think that uh, uh, certainly I'm finding that uh, uh, when I review these, uh, they because situations happen the way that they do, they do not get always turned on. And and I and I can honestly tell you, uh, and, and as I've said before. A body-worn camera is a tool that assists us in ass assessing what happens. A camera doesn't always see what an officer sees, right? If the camera is here and I pivot my head, I am reacting to what I'm seeing, not, not necessarily what the camera. But, but a body-worn camera does assist us, just like the dash cam here did. And so I think it, we would benefit from a consistent use of body-worn uh, camera policies then we can. Then our community knows what this, that standard is. Our officers are trained to that standard, and we're all on the same page, rather than this sort of uh, a patchwork of uh, use and non-use. Right. That's a great. Yeah, that's a great question. So when we look at it and we do our sequencing, it is important to recognize when the threat is articulated and when the engagement begins at that point. And so in, in one sense, we kind of freeze that moment. And at that moment, we're trying to look at both the objective reality that is available in its uh, totality of circumstances to the officer the subjective decision that the officer is engaging in and to see if there's a, co a, a collaboration that occurs over that. So in this scenario, the deadly force has already been initiated by, uh, by the suspect. The officer hears the uh, gun. At that moment, he knows that his uh, fellow officer has been shot at. He certainly has a reasonable uh, fear for his life and certainly for the safety of Officer Jackson. Furthermore, he says that the, it, as that happens, he sees that. So the, the threat is again immediately presented to him. As he starts to engage in evasive action, he's going gun on and unholstering. The, uh, he's getting tracked. He, uh, it comes to the front windshield. The exchange occurs. So now, one sequence has occurred. A second uh, uh, presentment of threat has gone. An exchange occurs. It, they were very lucky that this driver didn't understand this truck that was stolen because as he jumps, he misses that step. He goes down. That's why I wanted to show that second camera because as he goes down, he is presenting. So Officer Hoogbell says all, those first two events have occurred, but as he's running, he is pointing towards them. He feels the threat on it, and he, in, uh, as he goes further down, he turns around and then fires at him. So at that moment, that sequence, his decision to fire upon the suspect is one continuation of that uh, trying to stop that threat. And there are multiple presentments of that continuing that threat that occurs. So at that point, he is firing to stop that threat. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, whether, uh, whether the suspect turns, whether the suspect points, the decision to engage has already occurred. And so when the suspect is shot, he received certainly shot. We don't know when that shot occurs. We know uh, that the, it's certainly a, sh a, a shot to the throat occurs, a th a sh the different places that are occurred. But that is one dynamic fluid decision uh, that he's made. For us, it was important to say, the moment that the officer started to engage, was he justified? And if he is at that moment, then can we continue to articulate the presentment of that threat that has not been evaded? And our conclusion was, that the threat was valid and real for him within the totality of the circumstance, and the presentment of that danger continued to have, and the officer was continued to justify in the uh, trying to abate that. You can certainly break it into uh, into uh, almost three, maybe three and a half sequences. Is what I uh, when we broke it down: the initial shot, the presentment, the shot through the the window, the the, the, the when he goes down, presents the weapon when he goes down uh, uh, first, uh, the second time in the driveway. And the third time when he turns around and fires, because the officer says in that last sequence, he can hear the bullet whizzing by him and hitting the uh, fence behind it. Uh, because remember, he's to the side, so there's a fence there, and he can hear it. So all of that are three different sequences, and the threat never abates within any of those three sequences based on what we saw. Out of curiosity, uh, the, with the fact that this truck was stolen, uh, 
Um, officers don't often speak about how that's a particularly dangerous job to him. And so, can you speak to the, the, the fact that maybe this isn't a, a standard place where a shooting like this might occur? I think that it would be too easy to say this is a shooting, uh, uh, when the shooting is going to happen, when this is not. I think rather what I would suggest to you is that every situation uh, where and when it's objectively being presented presents the officers with that interaction. And they are constantly engaged in assessing that situation. So for example, uh, uh, Jackson talks about that the, the suspect is nervous, he can hear, he can see him shaking, he notices that he's starting to perspire, he is paying attention to these clues uh, that he's, as he's interacting. And now that may be because he's nervous, somebody's nervous because they may have some dope with them. Uh, or, or they may be, may be nervous because they're deciding that whether they're going to engage in a gunfight or not. So, uh, so that is the dyna dynamic nature of the situation. So the question then becomes, can I proactively act upon it? And can I articulate what that danger is? Or, or as that event unfolds, am I justified in both rationally perceiving it and reacting to it? And in this case, he's asking him. He's giving him all the commands. And you can hear him say to, on, on the radio, he says he's asking for backup to occur because these guys aren't a, a exiting out of there. OK, so it's passive resistance at this moment. But it's also a potentially dangerous situation. So he has to engage with the person, monitor the safety that he's at. That's why Hoogvelt is on the other side, because he's serving as a, uh, a safeguard for him and also to distract uh, those other individuals, to divide the attention of the other passengers to him while he can focus directly on to the, uh, to the driver himself. And it's when he says, I want you, he tells him, he goes, I want you to reach and open it from the outside. I don't want you to open it from the inside. I want you to reach. And the reason you're asking for that is because I know that there's nothing in your hand at that point. And he says his hand goes down, and his hand comes up with the gun, and the gun is presented, and the shot's fired. And he perceives it. His body is reacting to it. And he goes, I smell the gunpowder. I black out for a, a split second. He knows he's been hit. And all of that is occurring at that, in that quick second like we talked about. This is one of 30 officer-involved shootings so far this year in the state, many of which have been reviewed by your office. Why are we seeing um, more and more of these happen in a record time year so far? Again, you know, the question that sometimes I'm asked is, are these shootings, to, uh, what's the right number for shootings? And, and that is hard to answer because in some of the scenarios as we've indicated, this one being a, a perfect example, that shooting is justified and necessary in this scenario. So the best answer that I can give to you, what the right answer is, zero. That's the only good answer that we have. Because nobody wants anybody to be shot, and nobody wants anybody to be injured. But then, however, if the circumstances are ripe three times or five times, and those are justified as the use of force, then that's what the right number for that year was, because there were five threats that were presented. So I don't think that, I think we can, so we, we have to step back. And I think we have to sort of step back and say, OK, what can we learn from this? Well, we can say, certainly, there's uh, those threats that are there. And those that are clear uh, situations like this, we can understand that. But then what are the ones that are in the gray area? And what are the processes and procedures that we can engage in and the choices that we make that are in our control? Because here's the one thing. An officer can never control fully the actions of the person before them. And they're often reacting to that action. But we, as an institution, can certainly control our actions. So what are the things that we might be contributing to that are, that are increasing those numbers? And that is a, a healthy subject for debate. Uh, uh, you know, what are the processes, what are the protocols. In this case, this is a textbook example of following the process and protocol. The suspect is identified, citizen complainant, officers tactically approach it, they're engaging, there's no abuse, there's none, none of that, they're engaging, and then the situation evolves from there. But anytime we have more than one, uh, as I mentioned, any time a loss of life occurs in our community, regardless of the circumstances, 
then one thing that we can do and must do is to be as transparent, do our due diligence, so we can share this information in a transparent way with our community because so they can understand what the reality is and what's going on. And what is the difference between a shooting, which unfortunately and tragic was necessary, and a shooting in which it was unnecessary. And the more we can share this in a transparent way, then the, citizens, the citizenry is armed and informed to make that dis, uh, distinction. And if we're having too many of these kind, then we need to go back and always critically self-examine. Because one life is too many to lose in our community, and we owe it to our community at large to thoroughly review that. And where it's justified to call it that way, and when it's not, to point out that it was not justified. And that's why I wanted to take a second to commend these officers. Because I've come here many times, and it does not absolve our office of the responsibility of articulating what the facts happen, even when we do not get cooperation from some officers, who has their right to not uh, share with us. But these officers not only uh, shared that because they want to be held accountable and be transparent, but did so in a manner where they did not uh, review their uh, video evidence because they wanted to share exactly what transpired. So, so we commend them for that, and I think that only engenders more trust from our community when we follow those protocols. So with no overarching trends of there's more guns out there, more drugs, more Here, here's, guns. Here's, the, here's the thing that uh, I, I think most law enforcement will tell you. The prevalence of uh, handguns, the prevalence of weapons in our community uh, is a reality that they cannot ignore. At the studies that I've looked at, where we have the most liberal presence of weapons, there is the greater the anxiety of that weapon being present in the encounter that you have. There's been multiple studies that have, done, have been shown. The laxer that uh, uh, access is, the greater the uh, sequencing, uh, the greater the percentage of uh, officer-involved critical incidents that occur there. So I don't think that anybody can uh, 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 excuse away the the reality of uh, the prevalence of handguns in our community that contribute to that. And, uh, and, uh, and that's why I think there's uh, many times it is law enforcement agencies that have called upon our community and our policymakers to institute reasonable uh, gun standards. So, so that's certainly a strong consideration that they have, uh, that they worry about. Yes, thank you. So our goal is to preserve the integrity of our uh, investigation and to preserve the findings that we have. We have always made ourselves available to victims and victims' families and our, uh, our, uh, our decedents' families uh, uh, or impacted individuals' families uh, because we want them to know what we have reached and where we can maintain uh, that uh, 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 confidentiality, we have made ourselves available. Uh, and I can uh, tell you, there are family members who have expressed that interest. We've respected that and honored that. There are other times when we have said that if we share information that they cannot tell us that they'll maintain that confidentiality, then we notify them simultaneously uh, with, the, with what is going on. In this case, the family expressed a desire uh, to meet with me and, I, and whenever anybody has done that, we've always honored that. And as I mentioned, we met with them, uh, the father and the, uh, and the stepmom. And um, to their credit, as I mentioned, they wanted to make sure that I conveyed when I was here to the community how deeply and sincerely they were sorry for their son's action uh, and how deeply and sorry they were that, uh, that the officer got injured and they wanted us to communicate, and, uh, and the father um, you know, pulled out a picture and shared with me. He goes, this is the son that I uh, recognized. This is not the son uh, who I recognize whose conduct this is. And, and so it's a tragic loss for them. And we had an uh, uh, extended conversation about uh, regardless of what the circumstances are, uh, a loss of a human life in our community is a loss to some family. Uh, he's somebody's son, he's somebody's grandson, he's somebody's sibling, uh, and, uh, and uh, we need to find out why. 
So they were very gracious and uh, thanked me for uh, uh, finding this and laying it out for them so they could understand with some le level of closure and finality for them what transpired and happened with their son. And we, uh, we answered all their questions. They were very gracious, but again, they insisted before they left that uh, I share with the community and specifically with the West Jordan Police Department and this uh, Officer Jackson and Officer Hovell that how deeply sorry they were that, uh, uh, that they had to endure this. Anything else? Thank you very much.